I'd like to turn to board member Deborah Napper to open our meeting up. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We are now at approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? Is there a second? second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, Diane. Diane is um, board member Bellamy Small is on the phone. Diane, how do you vote on the agenda? Yes. Uh, all, any opposed? All right. Thank you. Dr. Contreras. Thank you and good evening to uh, our board members and to our guests and those who are watching. Uh, this evening, I'd like to present the 2022-2023 budget. And I will be presenting a budget that continues to focus on the board's strategic priorities. To address the priorities and the concerns that we have to, uh, which include facilities concerns and uh, the pandemic learning loss, I recommend seeking 18.75 um, 18 million in new funding from the county commissioners to support the following compensation initiatives. 10 million to increase our local teacher supplement, 5.5 million to complete phase one of our classified staff study, and 3.25 million to improve our local principal and assistant principal salary supplement. The proposed budget also includes the 8.5 million increase in funding needed to sustain our current service levels by matching state mandated pay and benefit cost increases for locally paid teachers, principals, and support staff that were included in the legislature's biennium budget. The increased funding would also pay for higher costs for utilities and liability insurance. In addition, 3.36 million in new local funding will be needed to pay for anticipated increases in charter school enrollment. To help offset these costs, district leadership has identified savings of 1.56 million, resulting in a recommended net increase of 25.7 million in local funding. In addition, my budget recommendation includes 10 million in capital outlay funds for deferred maintenance projects, including HVAC upgrades, roof repairs, outdoor lighting, and safety and security improvements. If approved by the school board and funded by county commissioners, Guilford County Schools operating budget for the 2022-2023 school year would be 251.31 million excluding capital outlay. Local funding would account for 25.3% of GCS's proposed operating budget, while state and federal funding would contribute 46.2% and 28.5% respectively. At this time, I'll turn this over to our CFO, Angie Henry, who will walk you through the specifics of the budget. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Good evening, board. Um, in front of you, you should have your budget book for the 22-23 um, budget recommendation. In that budget book, there is the, um, the superintendent's budget message. There also, I want to bring your attention to the budget report tab, where there are reports by fund of the um, two years of audited uh, information, the current year budget, and then the budget request um, is included in by fund in, under this tab. So um, I know oftentimes we get asked for detailed information, and this is where you, this is where it has been um, in the budget presentations we've made uh, for the last uh, several years. And then in the, under the uh, appendix tab, you'll see the uh, PowerPoint presentation that we're going to go through this evening. Okay, 
uh, as the superintendent mentioned, we are we um, did bid our budget with our strategic priorities in mind. The five, um, just to remind you of what those are, we've got reimagine excellent schools, eradicate gaps in, ac in access, preparation and achievement, improve operational efficiency, create pathways to prosperity, and invest in our people. First thing I want to talk about are teacher allocations. Um, many of you may have heard from schools this year that they are um, having reductions in teaching positions and their um, allocations for 22-23. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about why that is. Uh, we haven't in our budget um, cut, uh, made a cut to teaching positions, but as we go through our formulas and, the, and how the state um, has funded us in the last several years, uh, I think you'll be able to understand what's happening in our schools. So, so at our elementary schools, thank you. Um, our core teacher allotment formulas, and again, these haven't changed um, for 22-23. Per state statute in, in kindergarten, um, we uh, allocate uh, one teacher for 18 students, and uh, the class size cannot exceed 21. In grade one, it's one to 16, with a class size not to exceed 19. And then grades two and three, it's one to 17, with a class size not to exclude, uh, exceed, I'm sorry, 20. Um, in, in fourth and fifth grade, GCS allocates, um, we try to stick as close as we can uh, to 29 students per teacher uh, when possible. In our middle school uh, grades, the 2022-23 allotment formulas haven't changed again for middle schools that are included in the lowest 25 uh, schools in the district and performance receive 23 to one. Um, one teacher for 23 students in grades six through eight, and all of our other middle schools receive uh, one teacher for 24 students in uh, grades six through eight. At the high school level for 22-23, just like we have in the past, um, our grades nine and 10, we get one teacher for 27 students and one teacher uh, for 29 students in grades 11 and 12. So what we've seen nationwide, we've seen a decrease in uh, public school enrollment from 2019-20 to 2021. Uh, you can see uh, on this map, again, uh, nationally, you can see uh, where states are losing public school enrollment. When we look specifically at North Carolina, you can see between 1920, I mean 2019-20 and 2020-21, uh, across the state, we lost about 4.4% in public school enrollment, that's about 63 fewer students. You can see only two districts across the state gained students um, from month to ADM, that's Mount Airy uh, City Schools and Elkin City Schools. All other school districts lost ADM of at least at least 1% or greater with Rowan uh, Salisbury Schools and Weldon City Schools losing uh, the greatest percentage at, at nearly 18%. If you look at just numbers, um, the biggest decline in ADM is in Charlotte Mecklenburg, followed by Wake County, then followed by Rowan Salisbury Schools, Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools, and then Guilford County Schools. So when we lose um, ADM, based on the state formula, we would expect to lose uh, teaching positions or allocate, our allocation of teaching positions would decrease. When we look at um, the way the state has funded us for teachers in the last, I'm gonna say four years, we're gonna start with 1920 on this uh, chart. The state allocated us 3,317.5 teachers based on an allotted ADM in 2019-20 of 71,926. Our actual ADM at the end of the second month, so it's the best of the first month or second month, was 71,268. So the state made an adjustment to our teacher allotment of reduction of 11 teaching positions. And that's what happened to us in 1920. When we moved to 2021, the state allotted us 3,338.5 teachers for uh, based on an allotted enrollment of 71,331 students. Our actual ADM at the end of month two was 68,387 students. If we applied this, if the state kind of applied the same uh, formula and made a reduction, we would have expected to have lost about 50 teachers in 2021. But you can see the state held us harmless that year. So we um, have teacher, we had teachers in our district, 
um, based on the 71,331 projected enrollment. The same thing happened again in 2021-22, where we, the state, uh, allotted teachers based on uh, projected enrollment of 70,760. Our actual enrollment was 67,738. Again, the, the uh, state didn't take any teachers, um, uh, an adjustment for best one of two. They held us harmless. The difference you see between the number of teachers that were allotted in 2020-21 and 2021-22 um, are the program enhancement teachers I made a, um, in the footnote, including the footnote, they moved those to a different category. So that's where the 160 teachers went. It wasn't a reduction in the number of classroom teachers. They just put the, the program enhancement teachers in a different category. So, um, so we didn't lose teaching positions based on enrollment for the last two years. So those teachers stayed in our schools. This year, our uh, projected enrollment has gone down. We, what we are anticipating our initial allotment um, has gone down by 54 teaching positions. And so that's what schools are experiencing when they see our, when their um, allotted teaching positions have, have been reduced from prior years. I would help, right? As we lose uh, teacher positions, it also impacts our leadership as well. Am I correct? The admin positions. So the teaching the admin position formula for principals is based on number of schools with 100 students or more. Um, the assistant principal allocation is based on uh, student enrollment. Right. Projected student enrollment. Right. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our budget um, for 22-23 continues to include COVID relief spending. Uh, you can see here all the categories that we um, have, have budgeted our COVID relief spending for. Our uh, estimated carryover for our COVID relief spending is about 222.9 million dollars. That's what we are projecting to have at June 30th. When we look at the COVID relief spending that flowed to us through our state public school fund, you can see all the, the different categories that were funded and how much we've spent. We've spent 100% of the dollars that came uh, to us through our state public school fund. When we look at the uh, categories of spending and dollars that were allocated to us in the federal grants fund, uh, you can see that we received allocations of about $327.6 million. Of that, we've spent $104.7 million, or 32% of, of the total COVID relief spending we've got. Uh, and just to show it in a different way, you can see the from June 20th to September 2024, which is the timeline that we have to spend these dollars, we have $327.6 million to spend. Between June 20th and March 20, uh, 2022, uh, you can see that we've spent 104.7. Um, or about 32%, so we feel like we're right on track where we need to be as far as um, the pace of our spending goes with the um, COVID relief dollars. So what are we um, asking for new in our 2022-23 budget? The first thing is our teacher supplement. When we look at teacher attrition um, for 2020-2021 and compare ourselves to the state and other um, counties that we typically compare ourselves to. You can see that we are right on par with what's happened across the state. Um, only Wake County has done a, um, has got a lower teacher attrition rate for 2020-2021. Um, when we think about the supplement, if you'll recall, the superintendent did request um, in our 2021-22 budget, $10 million to increase our teacher supplement as part of a phased in approach to bring um, Guilford County to the highest teacher supplement in the state. Uh, the county commissioners did fund $8 million uh, in 21-22 specifically for the teacher supplement. Um, last year as well, uh, New Hanover County Schools, their, their um, county funded dollars to bring their teacher supplement to the highest in the state. Um, it didn't end up that way, but they were really, really close. They more than doubled their um, teacher supplement. Um, and, and again, and for the 2021 fiscal year, Wake County um, used $40 million in local funding. They made a, um, this announcement in 
December of 2021 to increase the teacher supplement um, by another one and a half percent, um, effective July 21st, 2021, um, to bring them um, above where New Hanover was. For 22-23, um, as the superintendent mentioned, we're requesting $10 million again to address our teacher supplement. Uh, the superintendent in Charlotte in his budget uh, request also included uh, a request for dollars for um, as part of his $41 million re uh, request to uh, bring teacher supplements uh, to the highest in the state. And then uh, Durham Public Schools and their budget request for 2022-2023 has asked for more $4 million to bring their teacher supplement from $56.75 uh, to $6,500. Um, as a reminder, the new state, uh, the $100 million in the new, the, the state funded for uh, supplement, teacher supplements, um, Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools, when you look at what they would receive, they would receive about $2.8 million to boost their teacher supplements. Um, on average, that would be about $619 for every state funded teaching position. Um, the money... Uh, will come from the $100 million, the new recurring $100 million fund that the state created to increase teacher supplements in the low wealth counties. And uh, as you know, Wake, Durham, Buncombe, Mecklenburg, and Guilford counties were not included in that um, funding or not eligible for that funding. Yes. Certainly, Orange County is. <laughs> um, so when we compare our teacher supplement, when we look at the, the um, impact of the $8 billion that we received from the county commissioners for 2021-22, you can see we did move um, above Forsyth County. Now this, this graph does not have the money, uh, the state money for Forsyth County in there. It had not been um, received and had not been paid out by the time uh, the reporting had to be done for DPI for this um, report to report the local teacher supplement. But again, we're one of the five counties that was excluded from the $100 million. We also are requesting uh, $2 million for our principal supplement. When we compare um, principal supplements, the top 10 in the state, you can see that Guilford County is number 10. Uh, we're behind Forsyth County, which is number two, Durham County, which is number three, and I think you've heard that we are um, consistently losing uh, good principals to those counties. We're also behind um, Wake County and Charlotte Mecklenburg County here. Uh, Wake did increase their uh, principal supplement in that same action they took in December 2021, part of their $40 million in local funding that they used to increase the principal supplement by 2.5%. Our assistant principal supplement looks very similar to what we saw with the principal supplement. You can see out of the top 10, Guilford County is ninth in the state. Uh, we are behind, again, Wake County, uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg County, Forsyth County, and Durham County for our assistant principal supplement. And we are, uh, we do have a request of 1.25 million to start addressing that in the 22-23 budget request. Um, and again, um, Wake County adjusted their assistant principal pay along with all the other um, adjustments they made in December 2021. Um, this past year, we have um, started work on, a, or we've had a partner start work on a, a compensation study for our classified staff. Um, the purpose of that study is to uh, provide equitable and effective compensation program that retains and attracts talent needed to achieve our organizational goals. The scope of the work is to update, update the job profiles, to complete a market study of total compensation. Um, those two parts have, of the work have been complete. We're also, they're also working to develop a compensation strategy and to redesign our compensation system. So as you know, the job market is still very volatile volatile and plagued with um, talent shortages. And that certainly has an impact on um, school districts that are struggling to hire talent that we desperately need in our classified positions. North Carolina is the fourth highest state in regards to the number of new jobs added post pandemic, which just creates more competition 
for a limited uh, staffing or labor uh, pool. Um, nearly 73% of the businesses are struggling to a attract employees, and that's um, because there's such a high demand for skilled workers. And uh, the, as we, um, as a result of that, the, the great resignation is expected to continue and job openings are predicted to continue outpacing unemployed workers. Um, the most effective way to retain talent in a nationwide labor shortage is to make across the board market-based salary increases. There's a great reprioritization of work, rewards, and careers underway with the labor force today, and it's putting significant pressure on compensation uh, programs for many schools and sorry, yeah, many school districts. Um, and uh, employees are looking for more than just uh, salaries. They're looking for sign-on bonuses, equity, cash retention, recognition enhancements, um, career uh, enhanced career and enable, enablement, emphasis on mental well-being, focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and learning and reskilling opportunities. So it's not just about what you can offer um, as far as a salary anymore. Um, the and the pay, base pay is expected to increase an average of 3.9% in 2022. And finally, um, we expect wages for new hires and workers in blue collar and manual service jobs are gonna grow faster than, than average. And the faster wage growth of new hires creates pay compression um, for those who uh, are more experienced in, in um, our workforce. And that puts further pressure on employers to raise pay across the board. As the superintendent mentioned, we do have five and a half billion dollars included um, in this recommendation to address phase one of um, this compensation study that would um, increase salary to entry level of a pay range um, that's been identified for uh, a select group of uh, staffing positions where we are um, having significant issues filling vacancies or significant challenges filling vacancies um, for these positions. So again, as we look at the 22-23 budget, we do have the 18.75 million um, to address the teacher supplement, 10 million of that's to address the teacher supplement, 2 million of that is to address the principal supplement, 1.25 million is the assistant principal supplement, and then five and a half million for the classified staff compensation study, um, the first phase of that. Um, the legislative impact of salary increases, you can see we expect our, our um, teachers, uh, based on the uh, salary schedule that was included in the second year of the biennium budget, we expect uh, teachers to receive salary increases between 1.3% and 5.35%. For our locally funded teachers, that's about $960,000. Our assistant principals are going to um, experience a similar increase. Their, most of their pay is based on the teacher A schedule. And so we, for our locally funded assistant principals, that's going to be about a $77,000 cost. Our uh, principals are going to have a 2.5% increase, again, based on the second year of the biennium budget, 2.5% uh, salary increase. We don't have uh, locally funded principals because the state has uh, covered the cost of ours, so we won't have a local cost for that. Um, our central office staff uh, will receive a 2.5% salary increase, and then our non-certified personnel will receive a 2.5% increase or $15 an hour, whichever is higher. Uh, the, those two um, add up to about $1.34 million, bringing the total cost for locally funded legislated salary increases to $2.38 million. Our benefit rates are increasing. Our uh, retirement rates going from 22.89% in the current year to 24.19% in 22-23. That's an increase of 5.7%. Um, and then our hospitalization rates uh, going from 7,019 per FTE to 7,397 per FTE, if another 5.4% increase. In dollars, the retirement rate increase will cost us for our locally funded staff $1.08 million, and then for um, our locally funded staff $440,000 for the increase in hospitalization rate. It's also important to note that as these benefits uh, continue, uh, rates and continue to increase, 
um, certainly it it's going to oh, okay it's, certainly it's going to um, increase uh, the cost of employing uh, one staff member if we look at a, at a, a individual making forty five thousand dollars a year uh, the new um, cost of benefits is going to be forty eight percent of that salary. just want to clarify on the retirement rate the change is the percentage change between the rate but the last column is the cost increase is it they both say change and one says okay. percent change but they're both yeah, percentages the, the, just trying to the change is the 24.19 minus the 22.89 right, so that's the percent of so, the rate right and then that's a 5.7 percent increase in the in rate. cost or in the rate it's in the rate so it's a 1.3 Point, a 1.3 point change right, right? 1.3 yeah 1.3 of uh, yeah. 22.89 is 5.7 yeah. <laughs> yeah. percent so you. in total that's the benefit rate increase is going to cost us 1.52 million for our locally funded staff mm -hmm. um, as the superintendent mentioned we do have uh, sustaining operation cost we are expecting an increase of 256 students in charter schools which would um, equal a about a 3.36 million dollar um, increased cost we're anticipating increases in utilities we know Duke Energy has told us that our electric's going up in September by nine percent so we're um, estimating a nine hundred fifty two thousand dollar cost associated with that and then um, our liability insurance continues to climb um, and we're uh, budgeting about three hundred thousand dollars for that increase bringing the total for sustaining operations to four point six one million dollars so in total, when you add all of these together, we've got the 1.875 million for comp employee compensation. The legislative impact for salaries um, is 2.38 million dollars. For benefits, it's 1.52 million dollars, and sustaining operations, the 4.61 million dollars. We did identify um, some reductions and redirections that we can use to offset a portion of these, uh, bringing our total ask of the county commissioners to 25.7 million dollars. We also are requesting for our capital um, annual capital maintenance funds, $10 million. We've identified $3,887,500 in HVAC projects, $2 million for safety and security, $1.5 million for uh, field lighting, um, $1,322,000 for roofing projects, $890,500 for system-wide side work, and this is paving. Um, some tennis court work, um, system-wide finishes, 400000 that's flooring, um, and things like that. So, again, our total request is $10 million. As we look at the, the summary for our state public school fund, our recommended budget's $465,485,369. That's uh, based on using the 2021-22 allotment formulas that we've uh, made an estimated uh, adjustment for uh, the impact of the salary and benefit increases. The state is allotting us for 22 23, 69,428 students. For our local current expense fund, our total recommended budget is $254,913,822. Of that, um, the request from the county commissioners is. $251,310,398, an 11.39% increase over the 21-22 county appropriation of $225.6 million. Also included in our local fund budget are fines and forfeitures, $3 million, and then interest earned on investments of $603,000. Our federal grants fund is using our 21-22 um, actual or planning allotments plus the estimated carryover that um, I mentioned earlier bring our total federal grants fund uh, recommendation to $286,595,462. Uh, we don't yet have our 22-23 federal planning allotments. Um, they haven't been released by DPI at this time. So when we look at our total operating budget and look at our state local um, and federal you'll see we're just over a billion dollars we're at a billion six million nine hundred ninety four thousand six hundred and fifty three dollars this graphic is not what we're used to seeing you can see uh, our federal grants fund has got 28.5 percent we're used to seeing that in the seven to 
9% range, uh, but because of all the COVID relief spending, our dollars uh, that we've got, that's why that number um, is higher than we're used to seeing. And that of course um, has an impact on the state percentage and our local percentage as well. When you see where the money is being spent, again, you can see that this has been impacted um, by the COVID relief dollars. Uh, we've got 70.8% on salaries and benefits. If you'll recall in prior years, that's been around 80%. Um, but because of the COVID relief spending that's included in this uh, budget, you can see that that number is lower and we've impacted our uh, purchase services and our supplies and material and our equipment. Uh, those numbers have um, gone up compared to where they typically have been. And then again, you'll see the same thing here. Normally what we spend in schools is, is over 80%. Now it's 77.1%. And you can see the other areas um, have, have changed from what we're used to seeing um, in our in previous budget uh, recommendations. So again, when we look at our um, the total budget recommendation for 22-23, you can see our state fund has increased and that's again because of salary and benefit increases. Our uh, local fund has increased and we've gone through the reasons uh, that, that we've included there with the compensation and the legislative impacts um, and the sustaining operations. Our federal fund has gone down. That's a result of the spending that we saw. You saw that we had spent 104 million of the ESSER money. So that's, that's the biggest reason for the um, decrease there. Our capital outlay fund um, is going, uh, we've requested 10 million compared to the 4 million that we received from the county in 21-22. Our child nutrition fund has uh, dropped slightly as um, you've heard uh, during our, at our last board meeting, uh, our waivers end on June 30th. Uh, we don't haven't heard um, anything about uh, the potential of those being extended. So that's gonna change the way uh, school nutrition, we're gonna go back to the way we've operated in the past for school nutrition. Um, our ACES fund is down a little bit. Our enrollment is not where we thought it was gonna be um, for 21-22. So we're taking that in consideration as we um, prepared the budget for 20, did I say that right? Okay, <laughs> for 22-23. And then um, the special revenue is up um, mostly due to um, the indirect costs that we're receiving from the COVID relief, the federal COVID relief funds. So if we go back to our strategic priorities, um, I wanna go through just what we've included in the budget that goes along with each strategic priority. So when we look at reimagining excellent schools, we've included in our budget access to extended learning opportunities, including our high dosage tutoring, our learning hubs, our fifth quarter and extended school year for our lowest performing schools, our increase in our public and private partnerships between businesses, universities, and school leaders, um, that one-to-one -one technology to enhance and personalize learning. And we've expanded the innovation and choices that align with student interest in industry needs, um, particularly in our CTE programs. Uh, the strategic priority for eradicating, eradicating gaps in access, preparation, and achievement, we've included in the budget expansion of our tutoring and learning hubs to support our most vulnerable students. Uh, again, the extended learning time, including our summer school, um, and the additional days in the calendar for our lowest performing schools. And then we've got significant investments in instructional materials and resources for all students. Uh, the work we're doing to improve operational efficiency, we continue to work on the implementation of a modern, fully integrated <laughs> ERP and uh, our enterprise resource um, planning system and a human capital management cloud-based software. We also are implementing a new bus routing system to provide service to families with greater efficiency. Uh, we have got dollars um, still in ESSER and in our uh, capital request to repair and replace um, portions of HVAC systems. We're not, uh, we haven't scheduled any full replacement of HVAC systems, but we are doing work um, in repairs in, in pieces or parts of those systems. Mm -hmm. um, we also have the installation in sa of safety and security measures across all schools. We're improving the district communications through unified communication voice over IP uh, implementation. And then we've increased the, uh, the network bandwidth throughout the district. Creating pathways to uh, prosperity. We've got strong post-secondary pathways that lead to high skill credentials. The, two gener the dual generation programming that effectively prepares students and their parents for jobs that earn a middle-class living standard. 
Uh, we've got in-state tuition assistance for GCS students who agree, agree to come back and teach uh, for Gopher County Schools. We've got uh, college access by ensuring that students are completing the FAFSA and at least one college application. And then we've got the dual enrollment programs, uh, the CCP, and access to tuition-free college level courses. And finally, investing in our people. Um, we've got recruiting, retaining, and rewarding highly effective staff in this budget. We've got the teacher career ladders. We'll continue with that. We've talked about the supplement increases we've got for our teachers, principals, and assistant principals. Uh, the first phase of our classified staff compensation study. Uh, certification and stipends for mentors are still included in this budget. We've got job embedded professional learning. Um, additional incentives for low performing schools that are and hard to staff um, subject area positions. We've got the career pathways and um, continuing the principal and assistant principal pipeline programs. So next steps in the budget. Uh, the board, this board will hold their public hearing on May 10th and approve their budget request to the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, we have to have that request submitted to the County Commissioners no later than May 15th. On the 19th, the uh, County Manager is scheduled to present his uh, budget recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners. And then for the rest of May and potentially uh, sometime in June, the, the County Commissioners will hold work sessions as they work through their budget. They do have a public hearing that they'll hold on June 2nd um, for on their budget. And then they're scheduled on June 23rd to, uh, I'm sorry, on June 16th, they're scheduled to, to approve their budget ordinance. And then on June 23rd, if the state hasn't passed uh, or finalized their budget for 22-23, we'll ask this board to approve an interim budget resolution until we can approve a final 22-23 budget and budget resolution. Oops. With that, there are questions. Um, thank you. I know you start working on the budget like last fall, um, and it's a behemoth, and it's, I think, more complicated when you take something so complicated and help um, bring some elegant simplicity to it. It's actually harder to do that, I think. So I appreciate the work that goes thank into you. this. You know, I think there's a Philosopher talks about the simplicity on this side of complexity and the simplicity on the other side. And I think y'all slog through to get to the other side. I really appreciate that. I, before I ask a couple of specific questions, can you just, because we go through this every year, but I know folks watching and we don't really know what the state's going to do, but there's assumptions in here about what the state's going to do. So can you just talk about if that's just based on last year or conversation with the state, how do you come to those assumptions? Because that's the sort of weirdest part of the whole thing is sure. the bulk of our funding comes from the state and then we often don't know what they're doing until after the school year's even started. Right, and that's, that's a, a very good question. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to mention that. So for 22-23, or I guess I'll start with it, when the state passed their 21-22 biennium budget, they really included and did a lot of work uh, for the 22-23 budget. Um, that's not always the case, but they do have a... Um, a teacher salary schedule, a new principal salary schedule, um, benefit rates, uh, and all that's based on what was included in the in the biennium budget. So, um, the nitpicky numbers like thirty dollars per student for supplies. We feel pretty confident that's what we're going to get, right? Yeah, we're basing we're just using this year's number and assuming it's going to stay the same, unless yeah. unless the number was impacted by unless it's a funding a funding source that funds salaries or benefits. Um, we made the assumption which is pretty staggering because you know as a parent or former parent of a of school age kids I, I spent a lot more than 30 bucks you know at walmart or target mm -hmm. um it, i also see that there's 32 dollars per kid for textbooks from the state um which of course won't buy one textbook but i know online they're less expensive do we have any idea what 30 bucks per kid will buy in instructional materials Whitney's like nothing you know some coloring books I mean even digital um are usually for a, a annual subscription would be closer to three hundred dollars per student for, uh, uh, for like a, a biology textbook for one right for one one subject mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, I mean, there are still just these huge gaps in the state budget, despite, you know, it's the biggest part of the state budget. It is, of course, but that's because we fund schools differently than other states do. So it doesn't mean we're spending more than other states. It just looks like a big percentage of the budget. And while I think we're making some progress, these are significant challenges that we face as a district with this. I mean, 30 bucks a kid for supplies. I think supplies includes toilet paper and soap, doesn't it? Or, or does that come from somewhere else? They, they don't fund custodial supplies. Yeah, so we got to come up with that right. somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, And $32 per kid uh, per student for books, materials, online, curriculum. It's pretty staggering. Um, so um, I would, I just, and there's other numbers in there, but those two really struck me. Um, I would like either the superintendent or Whitney or um, Angie, you could speak to, on page 52, um, this investment in instruction materials and resources, you know, is that ESSER funds, is that, yeah. I, th I think it's, they're from different places, but given the limited funding we get from the state to provide the actual meat, you know, of what kids are learning, I mean, we, we need people, we cannot do it without teachers, but teachers need resources. Um, more than just Google. And um, so can you talk a little bit about what those are? And I saw a reference to that as well under the investing in our people and how we're providing both instructional materials and, and how you all are conceptualizing the professional development training equipping of our staff. I, well, I, I will ask Dr. Oakley to speak specifically to that. But before uh, she does, I'll just speak to sort of the misnomers about uh, the ESSER the funds we receive and how much they can actually do. Because I often hear, wow, you receive $300 million. And when you think about the differences, uh, $300 million might be for Guilford County and $300 million for our colleagues in Orange County, Florida, for example, who have uh, new schools. And I use that example because Barbara Jenkins, the superintendent there, raised it herself. She doesn't have to spend a dime of that money on air filters or on anything for the buildings that we have to spend. So she can use that entire amount if she chose on learning loss. So there's a, a, a huge difference in the way in which the ESSER funds are able to impact the students. So we have been pulled in many different ways to try to make up for first not being able to compensate employees fairly. So to get employees to $15 an hour and then to pay for bonuses because our teachers uh, don't have the a similar supplement to Wake and Charlotte. These are things that other districts across the country are not having to use their funds for. Then to pay for basic infrastructure needs that other districts are not using the funds for. And then we're asked, okay, we still want you to close the achievement gap and to make up for all of the learning loss from the pandemic with $300 million. That seems like a lot of money, but it's very little when you have $2 billion in uh, school construction needs, $800 million in deferred maintenance in 2019. So think how much more it is uh, now. Uh, you have learning loss needs. You have all of these needs that people want you to address, rightly so, but you're asked to do it all with this part of money because you're not receiving adequate funding at the state level. So with that, I'll turn it to Dr. Oakley to say, we've tried to do the best we can to address all of, uh, as many of these things as we can, but we shouldn't have had to address compensation and facilities with ESSER funds. Thank you, so great question. Um, I think just talking a little bit and thinking backwards a little bit, um, when Dr. Contreras came in 2016 and asked where the curriculum was and there wasn't one, we started 
the work of bringing hundreds of teachers together and saying, what do you need? Getting their input and buy-in. Um, that happened between 2016 and 2019 when those first access to instructional materials began. Um, the state allocation for state textbooks is between like $1.5 and $2 million each year. That's not even enough for one grade level. Um, adoption and so we're just chipping away um, is really what we're doing. We started with the K-8 literacy and math. Um, we're in the process now of getting feedback from teachers. I will say that the first cohort of students who tested in 2018-19 were the ones that had had access to instructional materials when they were getting through elementary school and that was the year that we saw um, our test scores improve across the board for every student group. And so we're, we were in a place of really gaining traction with the board's willingness to deeply invest in the job embedded professional coaching. Um, to your point, what's in the ESSER budget versus what's in, in instructional materials. Um, global language teachers hadn't had new textbooks in 26 years. Um, really, 20, like the copyright date was 26 years on the Germans textbooks and the Spanish textbooks. And so we use some ESSER funds to engage those teachers in selecting new resources, um, something we wouldn't have been able to touch without some of the supplemental funding. We also um, got some instructional resources specific for our gifted students, which we hadn't been able to do, our English learners, which we hadn't been able to do. And then we learned a lot in terms of the digital resource world. There is nothing like holding a book, and I will believe that forever. But there were also some things that went really well when we started the digital, when we had some digital resources. And so the teachers begged us to keep some of those, um, like being able to pull down high interest articles in science and social studies for students in middle and high school who are at different abilities in terms of reading. And so those are some examples of what we've done with ESSER. And then we've just kind of pieced along and been able to sustain in the other areas. Can you just say a little bit about professional development and how that would unfold in this budget as well? So um, somebody asked us uh, during a board meeting uh, four or five years ago when we would be done paying for professional learning. Um, and I will always remember um, thinking about just the number of new and lateral entry teachers we had then. That was nothing compared to what we're facing now. Um, the fact that we have more teachers who haven't been through a formal training program coming into the classroom, like they desperately need this coaching. And they, we also learned that the teachers and principals were like, please don't pull them out and give us a sub to teach them how to do this. Bring it to us in the classroom, shoulder to shoulder, in my classroom with my kids. We still aren't doing enough. Um, but what we are doing is provide, targeting our new and lateral entry teachers, our lowest performing schools, and kind of tiering them based on the number of coaching days that they need. This year, we've been able to do a, a little bit better job of differentiating the coaching for veteran teachers. Great Great athletes need a coach, and great teachers do too. Um, and so these professional learning funds are to sustain that professional learning, get it out of just literacy and math. Science teachers need coaches too. Um, and focusing really on mentor training and then supporting those new and lateral entry teachers because we know those numbers are going to get bigger as we move forward. Did you want to add something? Yeah, just that Ed and C just reported that one-third of the state's teachers are lateral entry so I hope that um, one of the legacies I will leave is that we never, ever say again that there's too much professional development or we're spending too much or it's too much for the teachers to um, bear. Uh, you can never learn too much. And we have to keep providing coaching and support to our classroom teachers because uh, they are drowning with trying to figure out how to work with students who are at varying levels uh, in their uh, progress for reading, for math. Some are English language learners. Some are new to the country. Uh, some just have struggled all of their educational lives. And we have to support both the principals with executive coaching. Um, I think of some of the uh, new principals uh, who are in a position to become a, who have become principals much earlier than they would have been placed 
as a principal five years ago or 10 years ago, and they need coaching. And this would never be acceptable in the industry, in business industry, to put a leader in a position and not provide coaching. And I hope that we'll continue as much support as possible. However, the only professional development that is being funded by the state is reading. Uh, And I think that's at the elementary level. Everything else we are funding out of our entitlement grants, which is a problem. There's no other funding to support a third of our teachers who um, have not gone through formal training. Thank you. Pat and then Kim. Thank you, Angie, for uh, all the detail that's in here. I'm going to, I don't have a page number, but I'm going to throw this up. It's in the, I'm trying to, I'm going to try to go in order. I've got about three pages I pulled out. Uh, No, it's not in the blue line. Yeah. Um, But that's okay. We can, some have numbers, some don't, but that's all right. Um, I'm trying, I'm going to try to go in order so it's easier to follow along. Um, In the, uh, the allotment, the, the actual ADM that, um, I understand, I, I presume, presumably, and maybe you or Dr. Gutierrez can, can answer this, that was, I mean, COVID year, so numbers were way down. Was that based on, it? I mean, obviously attendance or some parents wanted to keep their children home or remote learning, what have you, or what, because what, when I first got on the board, I mean, we had 73,600 students or something like that. Right. And so I see it's going down, but I understand that, yeah, so maybe talk a little bit about Right. So, I mean, Guilford County is seeing what uh, school districts across the state and across the nation are seeing decreases in enrollment between 2019-20, which, you know, COVID, the pandemic started in March of 2020. Um, and then as we move into the 2020-21 um, school year, um, I don't know what else to say, <laughs> to say about it other than, I mean, that's just a trend we're seeing nationwide. Right. And, um you know the the state when they are allotting using uh, based on um, average daily membership, which um, is what when you see the actual ADM, that's what that is. It's how many students were um, enrolled in our schools yeah. during those first two months of the school year. Um, are you asking um, what happened? Do we know what happened to the students? Yeah, I mean, do, oh, yeah. Okay. How do we? Yeah, I mean, you, I mean school. I bet, I'm sure principals could tell you exactly how many students they had and how many they lost and. Mm-hmm. I would I think it'd be important to know some level of we do know the numbers and uh, where we lost the students uh, they were primarily at the kindergarten level and certainly at the elementary level where there is a child care crisis in the country so there was a connection between when schools were closed and parents needed child care so many of the students that went on to private school or charter schools did not return and you can see that at certain grade levels mm-hmm. Uh, but I think there's still quite a, a bit of uh, theorizing across the nation about where are the children, what exactly happened. Um, we also see large numbers of uh, homeschooled children and the number of African-American children homeschooled, homeschooled has quadrupled, while um, for other groups of students, children it has doubled but for african americans it has quadrupled so there are lots of studies going on we are using ESSER funds uh to use a pr firm to get out to our homeschool parents and to other parents to invite them back into the schools to ask them to visit our uh, magnet school programs our career pathway uh, programs and to just re-enroll their children so we do have an initiative to go out and get students to come back into Guilford County Schools. Yeah, and this is such a priority across the state that the state board has used some of their ESSER funding um, to allocate to districts for the location, the identification and location of missing children. And and we just received an, an allocation of $495,000 for that purpose. So, and that's, you know, that, again, that's going to happen across, to every, every district across the state. Sure. Well, that was my main concern is where are they? And I mean, I understand charter and private. That's, uh-huh. but then, yeah, you just worry about this, these peep folks in the abyss. That, and it sounds like they're kindergarten first in the earlier uh-huh. grades. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, and I'm just going to move along. I've got just two more pages. Um, 
again, I'll That's hold fine. this up. Yep. The COVID relief spending, the federal grant um, the itemized list. Mm -hmm. um, and these are just for my ed education. Um, so, the, for example, uh, Supplemental K-12 Emergency Relief Fund. Um, it looks like uh, I've scribbled on this, but I think that's 88 million, 648,591, that line item, supplemental ESSER two supplemental. Yeah, yeah that's, that's one, that's part of what makes up our $287 million that we had for the application that we brought and the presentation that we brought to you. Um, that 88 million is part of that 287 yeah. and, uh, million dollars. And, and we've spent a good, a good amount of that, which I'm pleased to see. Yeah, those dollars expire a year before the dollars that the, where you see the 198 million. Those those two numbers make up the um, application and the, the plan that we brought you, and those dollars expire first. So we're spending those first. I okay. So that may help because I saw the sort of the timeline that we mm -hmm. had the however, the four years. Right. So some so some funds you have to spend sooner than others. Right. Some August. funds will expire right. September of 2022. There are some yeah. that will expire September 23, and then there are the final uh, expiration is uh, September 2024. And, and some we had other grants for, remember, from the Dell Foundation and mm -hmm. others for learning hubs and tutoring. Mm -hmm. So we use those so that we can save some of the money for summer school coming up. So that's why you see yeah. zeros in some lines. Oh, yeah, and that... That's good because I'll go get to some of those zeros. Uh -huh. um, what can you just give examples? I think it's probably, I mean, I'll look at this first. I'm looking at this and I'll take this and marinate on it more. But especially, you know, for the public to see it or for the first time, maybe just a couple examples of what that emergency relief what that is, sure. like so, tactical things or... Right, so yeah. uh, these are uh, a lot of uh, what we've spent to date has been on um, the instructional materials and resources. We've spent a lot on um, bonuses, the board approved bonuses for all of our staff. So that, that came out of these dollars. Uh, we've yeah. uh, spent uh, dollars on uh, Wi-Fi, um, and on uh, the one-to-one -one devices. We spent uh, that first 20 million that's up there. We spent a, a significant amount of those dollars on that. We've we spent money on uh, summer learning last summer, and then we're planning mm -hmm. our programs for this summer. So we expect to see um, a lot a lot more spending in, in this summer. And then um, we've also um, ordered our buses, the buses that we're using to take high school students to GTCC so they can participate in the CCP. Um, and we, we've got those um, are coming in. Uh, we've got, what we, if you're asking what we've already spent, uh, we've spent a, a significant amount on bonuses and incentives for our staff. Yeah, yeah and, and that's probably as a follow-up, um, I'll send you some questions. I yeah. love to see breakdowns from, breakdowns of the breakdowns. You know? okay. um, I think they call it disaggregated, <laughs> but yeah, just because it helps me and people ask, mm -hmm. and I, sometimes I frankly, I, I know generically, but I, so we'll, we can do that, certainly sure. have time to do that in the coming weeks. Mr. Tillman, as a reminder, um, it, we wanted to be transparent, so all of this is on the district website for the public as well, Good. so they can go in and look at the spending. Yeah. So if anyone asks you, you can direct them right to the site to see the spending. Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, the, the more eyeballs, the better. Um, and so... And then another question. So I'll just, I, I think you already answered this, but so down below in the, uh, for example, the <clears throat> ESSER 3, the Cyberbullying Suicide Prevention Grants, um, we have, we've not spent anything, but we have more time. Yeah, and the spend. state is still sending us dollars. I mean, they're still working through all the money that they got. And so, I mean, even... I'd, I'd say in the last three weeks, we got the driver training money. It's still coming to us in, in small pots, and we just get notification that we've got these allocations. So um, that's that's the reason you see there aren't dollars some of, um, in spent in some of these. And, again, in some of these, as the superintendent mentioned, that we have got other funding that we're spending first, so these dollars are available um, for summer school. It's also an issue of districts can't find the staff or the providers and so many districts, well, every district I know has asked for an extension 
uh, especially when it comes to mental health, because everyone was looking for staff at the same time. And I think a few months ago, I shared with you the actual numbers of individuals in schools of education uh, and in schools of social work clinicians uh, who were in the universities, and they're very few. Uh, everyone's trying to contract with agencies at the same time, and districts have run into a lot of problems just trying to get contracts with technical assistance partners uh, because everyone in the country is doing it at the same time. In fact, I remember it was really good on us because we got all this in prior to a lot of the other districts. I remember there was right. I mean, you That's all. That's why we were rushing to so get the kudos. applications in. Yeah, I remember, mm -hmm. so thank you for that because – I mean, I'm sure that's that's helped. Um, and just, I won't go through all these, um, but what's the difference um, uh, as the homeless one and homeless two? I see there's, uh, you know, quite a financial appreciable difference between homeless one category and on that same sheet uh, at 150,000, and then homeless two as her uh, for 919,000, and we've spent. Yeah, looks like we pay taxes on it or something. So it three, looks, <laughs> it looks like it's just interest. the way the state decided to allot them. When I look at the the description and the purpose of the dollars, they're identical yeah. um, from in our and what we've received from the state on how we were to spend it. Its funds are provided to address the urgent needs of homeless children and youth stemming from the impacts of the novel coronavirus pandemic, including academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs, mm -hmm. and. Again, the way the state got these dollars and the way they've allotted these dollars, it may be that it was part of the second federal spending bill versus the third federal spending bill. It just it it's very um, it, it just it just seems to be very confusing in the way they've allotted these dollars. Yeah, and unpredictable. So it's right. just a here's these applications. They're due a week from Friday fill them out and we'll disperse the so like there's that too so um and i would also just say that um i don't know i think for public consumption the uniform guidance that's required in order to spend this money is really important to understand there are many many checks and balances in place everything has to be bid to the mm -hmm. superintendent's point there's many things we've bid and only gotten one response well you can't award that so then we put it back out yeah. so we're in this cycle of trying to get the best services and um it's it's challenging and um you know there is also this timeline that goes along with once you bid receive review award bring to you you know if needed right. all of those things mm -hmm. are um you know, it's just not a you get it and then you can turn around and spend it. Yeah, I mean, it's like there's a shot clock, I mean, too, on it. So you, 